welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. One of the things that you'll see in the research is that people who ask for quote unquote negative feedback, what the researchers mean is they're looking for things to improve, not just pushing for compliments, adapt more quickly in new roles and relationships, and they have higher job satisfaction and they get higher performance reviews. And when it comes to relationships with customers and clients, that is the way to constantly improve your collaboration together. Hi there, Innovator. It's really great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. And I trust you enjoyed my recent conversations with Elsie Flennard of Enterprise Now and with April Sprints of Driven Outcomes. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Sheila Heen. She's the co-author of Difficult Conversations and thanks for the feedback. She's the founder of the Triad Consulting Group and a lecturer on law at the Harvard Law School. Her corporate clients include companies such as BAE Systems, HSBC, the Federal Reserve Bank of the US, Merck, Novartis, the Standard Bank of South Africa, Unilever and many more. She often works with executive teams helping them to work through conflict, to repair working relationships and to make sound decisions together. She's also worked in the public sector with organisations like the Singapore Supreme Court and the Obama White House. She spent the last 20 years with the Harvard Negotiation Project, developing negotiation theory and practice, and she's appeared on shows as diverse as Oprah, The Gordon Liddy Show, NPR's Diane Rehm Show, Fox News, and many others. So I'm really excited to have her on the Innova Buzz podcast today. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build their professional credibility, engage their target audience, and connect with their ideal clients. Now, connection with your ideal client requires absolute clarity about who they are and how you can help them. And to help you get that clarity, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, where in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain that absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. For you, it's completely free. It's my gift to you for listening to the podcast. In our discussion today, Sheila talked to me about beginning the difficult conversation process with self-exploration. Work on yourself first. She explained the three types of feedback and the importance of appreciation. And she explained how to give and receive valuable feedback. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Sheila Heen. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from the greater Boston area in the USA, Sheila Heen. Sheila is co-author of Difficult Conversations, and also thanks for the feedback. She's the CEO of the Triad Consulting Group, and she's a law lecturer at the Harvard Law School. Welcome to the podcast, Sheila. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Scott Perry, who was our guest on episode 229 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we talk with you, Sheila. So a big hello to Scott. Yes, for sure. Hey, Scott. Thanks so much for suggesting me. Now, you've spent the last 20 years, Sheila, with the Harvard Negotiation Project at Harvard, researching and developing negotiation theory and practice. So that work 
has provided a lot of the material for your books, which I'm really looking forward to digging into a little bit more today, particularly the area of feedback, which is something that I've done a lot of work on and I've got some opinions on, so we might um, compare notes there. Now, before we start talking about all things conversation and feedback, give us a really high-level snapshot of your background. How did you get to where you are today and what were some of the key moments? Well, so I grew up in the United States in the Midwest and um, went to college in California and then came to Harvard for law school. And I came to Harvard Law School in part because of the negotiation work that was being done there. Um, And so during my first year of law school, which of course is graduate school in the U.S., um, was lucky enough to get a seat in Roger Fisher's negotiation class. Roger fought in World War II and um, wrote Getting to Yes and founded the Harvard Negotiation Project and was just a, a hugely inspirational person in terms of trying to find better ways for the world to manage conflict. So I kind of fell in love with the field. Mm. By the time I graduated from law school, I had been, you know, a research assistant and an intern and a TA and every other possible role I could persuade them to give me. And so then they offered me a full-time job coming out of law school and um, have kind of not looked back. Interestingly, I lived in Australia for several months a uh, couple of years after graduating from law school, came down to help start an affiliate in Melbourne. So my husband and I, who were just married, he also teaches negotiation, by the way, lived and traveled around Australia, and we've been back several times, loved it. An adventure to be named Sheila and live in Australia, but other than that, <laughs> <laughs> it was a great excuse to meet a lot of people, um, but really enjoyed our time there. Yeah, yeah. Well, were you at Melbourne University? We were helping start an affiliate called Conflict Management Australasia, um, which is still operating in Melbourne. And so Mm. we were traveling for clients and and training people there and collaborating with them. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, fascinating. I didn't know know that about you. So we came very close to crossing paths there because I'm about an hour outside of Melbourne. Oh, yeah. I have a daughter named Adelaide, partly because (laughs) of our fondness for our time in Australia, in fact. There you go. Yeah. Now, when did you develop your interest in the area of negotiation and managing conflict? Um, Trying to get what I wanted as a child. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My father is a lawyer and he's a negotiator. And so getting what we wanted as a kid, in addition to just the fact that kids are natural negotiators, like they Mm. instinctively pay attention to what works and they're willing to do whatever succeeds, right? Um, If they whine and until they get it and that's successful, well, we've just taught them to whine until they get it, right? So kids are natural negotiators no matter what. But my dad was an even more explicit negotiator as I got older. You know, I I went to him when I was probably about nine or 10 because I had wanted a horse forever. Hmm. And we, you know, growing up in Nebraska, that was possible. We lived outside the city. Um, and he would always say, save your pennies. So I went to him around nine or 10 years old to say, well, if I do save my pennies, can I have a horse? And he said, sure. Um, later telling me, because he figured, It was a throwaway line, but to me, it was a binding contract. (laughs) And uh, I got a paper route and delivered newspapers in the mornings. And six months later, I bought my first horse. So I think that um, with my dad learning to understand, you know, what was important to him and what it would take to get what was important to me um, was Mm. a great training ground in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lovely story. Now, I mean, it it raises for me the thought that, you know, you you wrote the book Difficult Conversations and it's around um, conflict or potential conflict situations and where people might avoid those conversations that can lead to a resolution or they could lead to something, no resolution if it's done poorly. Um, But a difficult conversation could just be a negotiation, right? Where we think there's an outcome that we desire 
and maybe we can't have it. And so we avoid the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. In other words, when we think about difficult conversations, I think they often happen in ongoing relationships, whether those are working relationships or personal relationships. Um, but they also can just arise in the course of a normal transaction, right? I thought this was pretty straightforward, but suddenly the way that I feel like I'm being treated and the fact that you're being so impossible is turning what I thought was a transaction into a pretty difficult negotiation or conversation. Mm. Um, you know, the, the difficult conversations work really came out of teaching negotiation and noticing that when things got heated and when the relationship started to fray, right, when trust was damaged um, and people were so frustrated with each other that then the disagreement was so strong that they couldn't find a way to work together. If getting to talks about separating the people from the problem, what about when it feels like the people are the problem? Yeah. Um, and that's what really turned into our work around difficult conversations to think, well, what might be different about these kinds of conversations or negotiations um, that would mean that we need additional insight and additional skill? I mean, I think people think of the word negotiation as meaning a very formal sort of process, right? Mm. Labor management negotiations or buying a car or a house or whatever. And of course, those things are included, but we really think of negotiation as any time you're trying to influence someone else. So in that sense, it's all around us, right? It's every relationship that you have um, in your life. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, we had a, a quick conversation this morning that was a very simple thing, but essentially it was a converse, uh, it was a negotiation. It was my daughter. I arranged for our bikes to be boxed and un. Um, unassembled because we're going on a tour tomorrow nice and and she said to me oh did you did you make sure you measured my seat height because it's important that my seat's at the right height and I said well I've got tape on mine didn't you put tape on yours <laughs> and and then it, she said no and then I said well I'll take a I'll organize a tape measure because she knows exactly the height it needs to be mm. um, so I said I'll organize to throw a tape measure into the into the bag so that was kind of it was just a simple conversation but essentially it was a negotiation it was a negotiation and, and it's it was sounds like it was sort of starting to have a couple of the hallmarks of particularly difficult conversations which is sort of whose fault is it yeah yeah <laughs> if her, right. her bike was disassembled improperly <laughs> i think she would yeah. say <laughs> yeah carelessly yeah <laughs> um, she's saying dad did you mess things up and yeah, you're saying, right. well, didn't you have tape on it? Yeah. You know, any any idiot would have tape marking how <laughs> where their seat should be, right? It's not my fault, it's your fault. Hmm. But but you you quickly move beyond that to think like, well, all right, is there is there a solution here that would simplify hmm. this? Um, but I yeah. think you're right when there's sort of a, a quick retort and things start to get just even a little heated, it's like, well, hang on one second. We're hmm. already into kind of the question of blame, which then can often escalate things further. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. When the emotions get involved, then that's almost a barrier to problem solving. And I know you mentioned, you know, the philosophy that uh, Roger Fry has in getting to yes, which is separate the people from the problem. But uh, one of the things you talk a lot about is um, working on your own mm. attitudes and your own kind of approach first, which I think is really fascinating because even separating the solution from uh, the people from the problem, it's still really hard to say, well, it's actually not my fault, it's your fault. Um, and I know you're a good person, but it's still your fault, right? <laughs> you, you seem most of the time to be a good person, but I'm yeah. starting to have my doubts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a nice insight, which is um, a, a big piece of understanding and then managing these conversations more successfully has to do with reflecting on and negotiating first with ourselves. Um, to get out of a blame frame, we would say, um, and instead to focus on what we call joint contribution. What do we each contribute to where we're at today? Does it matter? 
but if we can figure out what we each contributed, what we did or failed to do the goddess here, which might have been totally reasonable, nobody did anything wrong. Mm. But that tells us what we'd have to do differently next time so that it yeah. actually helps us turn that corner from blame into more constructive problem solving. And it encourages, it encourages us each to take responsibility for our part in it. But I've actually got to negotiate with my internal voice, what I'm thinking and feeling first, if I'm going to actually help the two of us turn that corner. If I could have written a book that would have magically changed the other people in our lives, I definitely would have written that book. (laughs) 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 So I just couldn't figure out a way to control anybody else. So all we can do is is control ourselves and and give the other person the best invitation to a different kind of conversation. Hmm. Yeah, I think... The one of the things where emotion really makes it hard is to um, step back and say, well, the other person, you know, that there's every chance that the other person, although you don't agree with their point of view or what they're doing, that they actually have the best of intentions. Mm-hmm. And that I think that's the the difficult bit to kind of come to terms with. And then once, but once you accept that, then you say, okay, well, why? why am I reacting the way I am to what they're doing, which comes from the best of intentions and how can I change my approach? Well, and also that pulling apart of intentions from impact, meaning well-intentioned people have bad impacts on each other all the time. Mm. Right. Um, I was trying to be helpful and instead I actually hindered things. Mm. Um, And I think one of the things that has helped me is to pull those two things apart and to to actually hold each of them equally and on their own merits. In other words, the fact that you had good intentions is important. I can decide whether to believe you, of course. Yeah. Because yeah. You, other people's intentions are invisible to us. That's part of what's hard. Yeah. Like what what are they up to? What, did they do that on purpose? So holding holding intention separate from impact means remembering I don't actually know. People often say you should assume good intentions. And I Mm. think that often it's true that people have good intentions, but mostly I should just assume I don't know. I don't Mm. know. And probably they're good, but whether or not they're good, we need to talk about the impact. And by the way, the fact that I had good intentions doesn't excuse the impact. I think often it's like, well, now that I've explained that I was just joking, you're not allowed to be upset. And I think that that's actually not right either. That, um, if even if you did have good intentions, we need to talk about the impact that you had on the team or on the project or on me, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great point to focus on the impact because as you say, you um you can make an assumption about the intent and often the default assumption about the intent is bad, and then you lose focus on the actual impact. And focusing yeah. on the impact probably is a step to move move in a positive direction. And also just raising the issue by describing the impact that's problematic rather than raising it by accusing someone of having bad intentions. Like, Mm. I don't know why you insist on undermining me is going to immediately have you jump to defend yourself and the fact that you weren't trying to undermine me and I'm just being hypersensitive. But if instead I say, you know, look, I was surprised when you interrupted um, in front of the client to, you know, re-explain things. I don't know whether you were aware that you did that, like what was going on from your point of view. One of the reasons I'm raising it is that I think it, it did actually um, change maybe how the client saw me or I was worried about that. So that's why I wanted to talk about it. So, so I'm being very careful to pull those apart and talk mm. about each of them. Um, talk about each of them in a way that, I can speak to. I can definitely speak to the impact on me. Yeah. But I can't say for sure what your intentions were, so I want to be careful not to do that. I can put mm. that out there as a question. And it's a lot more specific in terms of the effect it's actually had, which I can't argue with. Because right, I, exactly. It, it, it's the effect it had on you. That's right, exactly. And and that's, that's why. Thing. Mm. That's why it's chilling innovation. And I don't tell you any of my good ideas because you interrupt <laughs> to actually ruin them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
kind of as a natural segue into feedback because mm-hmm. I think to take that approach to a potential conflict situation and to have that conversation, that is one form of feedback. And I know in your book, you know, the subtitle is The Science and Art of Giving Feedback. So I'm fascinated how you see, you know, those two things, how you see there's a science to feedback and also an art to feedback. Yeah, well, I think that probably one of the things that you see in both of our books, both Difficult Conversations and Thanks for the Feedback, um, and maybe this is the, the legal training in action, which is that they are highly analytical books about soft skills and relationships. Mm. So we're really pulling apart what is going on and what are the patterns that we see What are the landmarks to look for in terms of the elements or dynamics of the feedback or the difficult conversation? And then that helps you know what kinds of skills that you need to hone or how you need to show up in the conversation, including the negotiation you need to have with yourself in order to do that. And that's the art piece of it. Mm -hmm. In addition, the field is just such a deeply interdisciplinary field in and of itself that that we have to be reading and learning across, you know, all the social sciences, right? Behavioral economics and sociology and psychology. Um, We need to be reading in the neurosciences. We need to be taking a look at um, the ways in which sort of influence and persuasion was the latest research there. And so a lot of what we're doing is that we're reaching out in all directions to try to understand what are the different things that influence what we can learn about this. So feedback, it's funny, and and I'm interested in your opinion on this, because typical scenario is, oh, let me give you some feedback. And then immediately the other person goes, oh, Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it was very defensive, uh, closed down all their listening facility and bracing for some piece of criticism. So what, yeah. what's your take on feedback that, uh, you know, that that's kind of people's general perception of what is meant by feedback? Yeah. So one of the challenges we had was that we were trying to write a book about, about feedback and feedback is a, just the word itself is something nobody really wants to spend any time with. Um, it's come to be kind of a bad word because it it ends up being correlated with some really painful experiences that we've all had. So I do think that as human beings, being on the receiving end of feedback sparks a set of trigger reactions to that feedback. And so um, what we found is that when feedback is incoming, we have three kinds of different triggered reactions and that those triggered reactions themselves mean that we shut down and and dismiss the feedback. Um, Or we're we're assessing it right away to decide, is this right or is this wrong? And if I can find something wrong with it, thank goodness, now I can set it aside and relax and go on with my life. Or if I can't find anything wrong with it and I think it might be right, it's really devastating Mm. in many cases. So um, I think that Part of the the learning for me has been to just recognize the triggered reaction, which is normal, recognize that I'm trying to spot what's wrong with it, but also that I'm always going to be able to find something wrong with any feedback I get. And in fact, it might be 90% wrong, but the last 10% might actually still be valuable to me. And so it's not a simple black or white, it's right or it's wrong. Instead, any feedback I get, I need to be sorting, first of all, understanding, which is more challenging than it seems, and then sorting for what may or may not be valuable to me. And that involves much more dialogue, actually, with my feedback giver. Um, And it also means that I may hold on to it and think about it for quite a bit longer. Or I may come back to the person and say, I have really thought about it, and I'm, I'm not going to take that advice, at least not Mm. for now, but we're at least having a better conversation about it. Yeah. Yeah. So with feedback, what, what are your suggestions as a feedback giver, how to give good feedback? Well, the first thing is, is to understand that we actually lump a whole bunch of different kinds of feedback 
into this word feedback, right? So mm. we throw around this word, but there are actually, we think there are at least three different types of feedback that have actually very different purposes. And part of the trouble we have, whether we're a giver or receiver, is that we mix them up. So mm. the easy way to remember the three different kinds is the acronym ACE, A-C-E. The A is appreciation, which just says like, you know, I see you, I notice what you're doing, what, what you, it costs you to deliver this to me, like matters to me. I value what you bring. I value your advice. Um, appreciation is, has a big impact on engagement um, and persistence and morale. Um, and, it, you know, it's often in short supply. Um, mm. And uh, if I feel underappreciated by someone... It's really hard then for me to take any of the second type of feedback from them, which is coaching. Hmm. So the second kind of feedback is coaching, which is anything designed to make me better, more effective, more efficient, more knowledgeable, um, a better teammate, a better leader, et cetera. So it might be advice, suggestions. It might be, you know, coaching has become kind of a term of art in the business world for an elicitive way to help me learn that's included, but anything designed to help me get better is coaching. And that's really the engine for learning. And in the innovation space, by the way, coaching is really the engine for us learning to collaborate more and more effectively together and to learn from trying things out, right? Hmm. Um, trying things out, what does and doesn't work? What should we change? What ideas do we have? Um, what advice do you have for how to tweak it, et cetera? But if I feel underappreciated and the first thing you have to say to me is something you want me to change, yeah, that's not going to go well. Just a tip for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that coaching thing then bumps into the third type of feedback, which is evaluation, which rates or ranks us against some set of expectations or um, criteria that judges us, right? Um, what's our performance review rating at the mm. end of the year, but also anytime we're making a judgment about someone or something, you know, that was the best interview you've done in, you know, all year is a rating or ranking. Mm. Also, look, is this, is this prototype ready to go to be seen by, you know, the client or the customer? or our boss, that's also asking us to evaluate or judge, does it measure up? So part of what's hard is that evaluation is a judgment. It doesn't necessarily tell us what to do to improve. It just tells us where we stand. And often we mean to coach, but we are heard as judging or criticizing. So that phrase constructive criticism, I think reflects that confusion like the mm. person is trying to be constructive when they're offering the suggestion, but it also tells the person, yeah, you don't really measure up. You could, could and should be better. Mm. So um, those three kinds of feedback bump into each other and we're not clear either what we're offering someone else. And we don't even think to ask them what would be helpful to them right now. Mm. That's a really good breakdown of, of the feedback. And I love the, appreciation part of the feedback one of the things that i always find frustrating though is if people give you feedback and they oh that, that was great or you did a good job there and yeah. so whilst it's maybe a good stroke for the ego it isn't really very specific and it doesn't help the receiver of the feedback to identify, well, what was it that I did well? What, what should I keep doing that that person loved? Um, yeah. And, and at the, the other side of the coin though, is that the, the coaching type feedback, which is, um, you know, that bit really, that bit wasn't really very good at all. It would have been a lot better if you had to use yes, less slides or talked less or whatever it might be. So the negative stuff tends to be very specific. Yes. Yeah. So when people, so let's talk about the difference between um, appreciation and evaluation, because you're, you're totally right that positive evaluation often is super general. That was great. You're doing a yeah. great job. Keep it up. Right. Yeah. And you're like, uh, okay. 
<laughs> you're not sure whether it's genuine and you yeah. definitely aren't sure what it is you're supposed to continue. Mm. So, so by the way, it's not just that evaluation is negative and appreciation is positive. Evaluation can also be positive. Mm. Like that's, you know, that was the best presentation you've given today. <laughs> Pretty mm. bounded, but <laughs> today, and that will double as appreciation, but mm. there's also appreciation doesn't have any evaluative content like hey thanks a lot thanks for yeah. everything see you later and and so you're right that one of the, in either of those camps often we skate over it to get to the coaching or change that we want to talk about and that feedback sandwich that people sometimes talk about like say something good hmm. quickly slip in something bad <laughs> and end with something good and maybe they won't notice um, I think it's well intentioned in that it's trying to help you have a conversation that includes a balanced perspective because most people are doing some things well. But the problem is that the the bread on each side of the meat in that sandwich ha almost has no content, and also people catch on that like there's a but coming here. You're yeah, starting yeah. To be positive, but I can tell that's not what this conversation is really about. Mm. So we really need to give genuine and specific, both appreciation and positive evaluation, sort of day in and day out, especially appreciation. And that actually creates the space for us to cut to the chase to talk about what could be better without needing to pad it with a bunch of, um, mm. with a bunch of positives around it that aren't really the genuine topic of what we need to talk about right now. Yeah. So in, in some ways, what you're saying is build a relationship by building that or, or continuing to deliver appreciation, but in a very specific way. And, and then you're essentially building up a bank account where you can then have the coaching conversation or the evaluation conversation and bring in some areas that are for discussion for improvement. Yeah. And it's interesting that we don't appreciate more. Um, because it's, it's cheap, it's very cheap, <laughs> meaning <laughs> I, I don't mean cheap, like negative cheap, not yeah, bad, yeah. cheap, um, like a cheap shot. I actually yeah. mean, it costs easy us to do, so isn't it? little, yeah. right? Mm. It's easy to do. It takes only a moment even to be specific. Mm. Um, but I think that a couple of things are contribute to the fact that we often don't appreciate as often as we should, one is that just naturally day in and day out, we're focused on the problems we need to solve, right? Mm. And then the second is if we're not talking about some of the coaching or the things that I feel frustrated by when, as we're working together, then if I'm frustrated and I'm not talking about the coaching, it's going to get in the way of me being able to share the appreciation. Like it's yeah. hard for me to appreciate you for some things I actually genuinely do appreciate you for when you're also driving me crazy at the same time. <laughs> but I don't want to tell you that, right? Because yeah. I don't want you to be mad at me or you're going to disagree or something, right? And so the fact that we don't talk about the coaching is also, I think, something that gets in the way sometimes of genuine appreciation. Hmm. Yeah. And we talked earlier about working on yourself first in negotiations. and And if you think about it, it's pretty much the same for ourselves because we don't take time to celebrate a success or celebrate something that's done well or even to keep note of it. And yet, you know, as soon as something goes wrong, we said, oh, you know, I should have done that better or I should have done that different. And we kind of beat up on ourselves. And and when somebody asks, how are you going? You know, we, we often respond with, well, I'm okay, but, you know, I've just had this really bad experience. And yet, Mm. You know, you forget about all the good stuff that, that is there as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a that's such an important observation. I I do think that often the feedback that we have for ourselves can be the most painful. In mm. other words, we're not only focused often on sort of the the frustrations and hassles in just daily life, but also we're hard on ourselves. And we don't give ourselves as much leeway to feel as positively about what we should feel positively about. Um, but the negative feelings are stronger and the self-criticism is stronger. 
um, which is a funny, a funny phenomenon. It's, it's almost like we don't have an emergency system. So, so just physiologically, we have a threat system, right? Yeah. So you get a surge of adrenaline and, and all of that when you get criticized, um, or when someone says, can I give you some feedback <laughs> <laughs> on alert, high alert. Yeah. And we don't really have like an appreciation alert system that is positive. <laughs> and, and that's kind of too bad because mm-hmm. I think that um, the negative tends to be stronger than the positive no matter what. And then we forget to do it. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Build an appreciation alert system. Where you, you know, right. The trigger, yeah. trigger word so you open the floodgates. <laughs> that's, that's right. I mean, it's like, oh, we have an appreciation emergency. Like, you don't really hear that very often. Yeah, yeah. But maybe we should. <laughs> All right. Well, this is really fascinating, Shilda. I could go on talking feedback and giving and receiving feedback. I guess one question before we move on to the buzz, um, receiving feedback, what, what steps um, should – each of us take to be able to receive feedback in a way that you know it could be helpful and bearing in mind that if I give you feedback it's just my opinion Mm -hmm. but but at the same time I I think you know if I receive feedback from someone there's a potential gift in there and if I can listen and receive that there, there may be something there that I can change and be better so how how do how should we go about you know, being receptive to feedback. Well, so one, one thing is to, um, when someone does offer you feedback to set aside, do I agree or disagree with the feedback and first just work to understand it because that Mm. actually takes quite a bit of back and forth. One of the things that we talk about is that feedback usually arrives in the form of these sort of vague labels or phrases like, you know, you did a great job or Mm. we'd love, we'd love it if you guys could be more responsive or we'd love to see, we'd love to see you be a little more innovative. Right. Mm. And that could mean a hundred different things. So rather than think to myself, well, that's ridiculous. I'm like the most innovative person, you know, Um, (laughs) instead just saying, huh, I wonder what they mean by innovative. Like, where's that coming from? Is there something they expected or were hoping for that they didn't get? Or what if, if I were more innovative, well, what would I do differently? What specifically would they see from me? And those are great questions to ask them. Hmm. So just saying, wow, that's fascinating to hear. Talk to me more about that. And to ask those questions, either we like to say that feedback has both a always a past and a future. So either I can ask questions looking backwards, like, Mm. oh, where'd that come from? Something happened that caused you to say this to me, or you expected something that didn't happen, maybe. Or I can ask questions going toward the future. If I were to follow your advice, what specifically would I change? And that often can help me hone in pretty quickly on what you mean. Mm. And so first, I've just got to understand what you mean. And then I can decide, ask myself two questions. What's wrong with what you've just said? What's wrong with your feedback? I have lots of, you know, I'm going to go out and make a list because that's going to be fun and cathartic sometimes. But, but when I'm done with that, I need to ask a second question, which is what might be right about it? Hmm. And that's the question that is going to open me up to seeing something maybe I didn't see or consider or think, huh? I don't want to be like them. I don't think they necessarily know what they're talking about. I don't think their advice would work. But if I think about what they might be right about, it's possible this this is a bigger issue than I thought it was, right? Or a bigger problem. And maybe mm. maybe I'll figure out how to solve it my own way. But yeah. that's the piece of the feedback that might be valuable to me. And so what might be right about it, I think, is a really important second question. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice, and and to look at it through your own lens, and and to kind of take it up to a higher level and say, well, you know, what what is the issue overall that contributed to that feedback, and therefore, you know, what might I be able to do about it in detail if I choose to? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. That seems yeah, right. Great, love it. All right, well, let's move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to help our audience who are primarily 
innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and the first one is kind of the more innovative question, <laughs> a little bit general, <laughs> um, but hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers and inspire the audience to go and do something awesome today. So what is the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Mm, well, you know the question, the answer I'm going to give, which is they need to seek out feedback. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and not and not just from um the people that you think know what they're talking about, right? The experts, etc. Often the best learning can come from unexpected places. Someone who actually is not familiar with what you're trying to do but asks a dumb question that you mm -hmm. suddenly realize, "Oh, I'm so in it that I can't see the way that what's confusing about it from the outside or why someone would need it. Right. And so yeah. from my point of view, it's often the people we, who don't know a lot or who we find difficult, who are our most valuable feedback givers. They can be the MVPs of our own learning and show us things that we otherwise wouldn't see as we yeah, try to. Yeah. That's great advice. And I was having a conversation the other day with someone on the podcast who's a, a, a kind of a consultant or CEO for hire and she changes businesses, triggers awesome growth in those businesses. And she said her biggest skill is going into a business where she knows nothing about their industry and nothing about how they run the business and asking all the so called Dumb stupid questions. questions. Yeah. 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 And and I so resonate with that because when I go into a team that's having trouble working together, I'm the one who asks the either the dumb questions or the questions that people are afraid to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, because there are entrenched views about things. But if they're going to break out and see a different way for them to work together, which is innovating, right, in how they function as a team, um, it's going to be because someone asks a question about whether the way things are has to stay that way. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Um, you know, it took us seven years to write the first book. Um, and then there was 15 years between the two books. So I would not say that I'm a super fast learner. <laughs> <laughs> but in both cases, what we were listening for, we were listening for the things that people were telling us they were still struggling with. Hmm. Like what, what our advice wasn't solving for them. And what we started to notice was patterns to what people wanted help with where we didn't have answer and paying attention to where don't we feel like we have satisfactory answers yet was what led us to finding the right question um, to try to investigate and that where we needed to learn something new. And so listening for what I don't know is probably the most important thing that I've mm. learned. Yeah, that's a great answer. I love that sort of the listening, but listening to what you don't know yet and where people are struggling and looking to you for answers. Yeah. And as an expert, right. Quote unquote, yeah. put really big quotes around that people are coming to you for help and you feel like, well, my job is to have answers. So I'll give you the answers that I have and I'll kind of brush away the questions that I don't have great answers for, mm. but instead I need to scoop those questions into a bag and carry it around with me because I'll start to notice that the bag is getting pretty big. <laughs> yeah. and full and that a lot of those questions have some similarities to them so obviously there's something here for us to learn hmm. yeah it's in a way it's kind of feedback isn't it because um you know that there, there's experts out there who kind of they protect their expert status so that's part of their identity so they protect it really well by giving answers all the time to every questions and there's other people yeah. who value learning and growth as well so they may have a lot of knowledge but like you they um, then look at well where are the gaps and how can I learn more how can I address or serve that audience with this knowledge that they're seeking um, that I don't yet have the answer to yeah and I think that um, 
whoever you are, whether that's officially your role or not, feeling confused and feeling at a loss um, to help someone else who wants your help is not a comfortable feeling, no, no. no matter who you are. Yeah, And I think that what's what I've learned is to lean into that feeling a little bit and see it as maybe it's, this should be an exciting feeling because it's telling me there's something here that has the opportunity for me to learn something new. So to sit with that discomfort and confusion rather than to brush it away. Hmm. Hmm. All right. I love it. Yeah. Do you have a favorite resource you use most often? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, probably the resource I use most often is people I think are smarter or more knowledgeable than me. Mm. And that is humbling, right? To, to realize I could research this, but the fastest way for me to get a handle on this is actually to reach out to somebody who I know navigates this better than I do and ask them, Hey, do you have 15 minutes just to school me on this? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it changes our relationship. Number one. Um, but number two, I get not just the information, which I could have gotten from lots of other sources, but I actually get their wisdom and experience and learning all packaged up with the information. And that actually is worth its weight in gold. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice, reaching out to people at a human level. And um, and as you say, there's not just the information, but the insights and the interpretations and the whatever colorations might be there that make the particular thing work in that expert's hands. Absolutely. And, and of course, their view is going to be biased. Mm. Because, you know, they, there's that saying, all advice is autobiographical, right? It's filtered by our own experience and the way yeah. that we've made meaning out of it. So, of course, I'm listening for that also and thinking, well, you know, what do I want to take away from this that might be valuable to me? And what do I want to hold with a little bit of a grain of salt? Um, but either way, I learn a huge amount about whatever the topic is that we're talking about, but also about them and about myself. Hmm. Yeah, wonderful. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client or a project on track? <laughs> Ask the client for feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that I I think the question that we often use to ask people for feedback, which is, hey, do you have any feedback for me, <laughs> is a natural question, but it's actually not not an easy question for anybody to answer. So they say like, no, you know, everything's great, et cetera. And then, of course they stop using you and <laughs> you think, well, yeah, God, yeah. I asked for feedback. They didn't give it to me. Mm. Instead, what I try to do is I try to ask periodically for one thing. Hey, what's one thing that if we changed it about the next time we do this together would make it even better from your point of view? Or what's one thing that if I am able to get to it this week would be valuable for you? That what's one thing question is super easy to answer. It's really clear what I'm asking for. I'm not fishing for compliments. I'm asking for what I can actually improve. Give me a little bit of coaching about what would have a big impact on you, a big positive impact on you. What would be most important to you? I'm learning something about their priorities. Um, and also I'm constantly improving how we're collaborating together and what I understand about them. One of the things that you'll see in the research is that people who ask for quote unquote, negative feedback, what the researchers mean is they're looking for things to improve, not yeah. just pushing for compliments, have adapt more quickly in new roles and relationships, and they have higher job satisfaction, and they get higher performance reviews. And when it comes to relationships with customers and clients, that is the way to constantly both strengthen um, and improve your collaboration together. Hmm. That's fabulous advice. I mean, it's, it, it's basically making it very specific from the question point of view such that the person is invited to give very specific feedback and there's parameters around the expected answer if you like yeah and, they, and in, in the early stages they can decide how much risk they want to take right mm. being honest with me but what i'm also doing is i'm signaling that throughout our relationship i am expecting that there's if there's an issue you'll raise it with me yeah um, and so that when they do raise something that I didn't even see coming, 
um, they feel more welcome to raise it, right? Because mm. I've signaled like, whatever it is, we'll sort it out. Um, yeah. So it doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be a difficult conversation. It can just be some joint problem solving. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. All right. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Hmm. Um, I think that often we think that to differentiate, differentiate ourselves, we have to know something unique. Um, you know, I have to be smarter or more knowledgeable or more well-connected or something. And, and and certainly if you have that as a differentiator, like make the most of it for sure. Yeah. Um, for as long as it lasts until somebody catches up and passes you and does it better. Um, but the thing that I think is underplayed is what it's like working with you. So there's that old saying, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know, which mm. I always hated because it felt so unfair. <laughs> and what I've learned over time is that in reality, it's it's a little more subtle than that. It's who knows what you know and would recommend the experience of working with you. So, you know, the network means that they bump into one of your clients or customers bumps into somebody who's a friend of theirs who has a similar problem. And they say, you know what, I have exactly the person to call because she, it, this is right up her alley and she's awesome to work with. Hmm. And that is what's going to bring new business in the door. So that combination of being not just knowledgeable, but also really easy to work with and to solve problems with as they come up um, is a killer combination, not just for the project you're doing now, but for the word of mouth that follows you. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, and it kind of speaks to the whole idea of that it's equally important to focus on the experience that your client is having with you um, as it is to focus on delivering the knowledge or know-how that contributes to their success. Yeah. And, you know, the, I think the conventional wisdom says that, you know, if you're the expert, if you're a diva, if you're better than everybody else at the top of your field, et cetera, well then it doesn't matter if you're a jerk. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, and people will point to Steve Jobs and everybody else, but I will tell you, I would not have wanted to live his life and the mm. number of you know, times he got fired and alienated and all of that. Um, so I think that actually it works in the other direction. The better you are, the more it makes a huge statement when you're an act, actually a really easy person to work with, which doesn't mean that actually you're saying yes to everything the client wants. It means you're mm. helping them think carefully about trade-offs where, and what they trust you when you say, actually, I don't think that that's going to get you what you want. Um, I think this other way of going about it, um, which might actually even be cheaper for you or is more likely to pay off, right? Well, that's a move around trust. That means that as we go forward, if I, the next time I recommend something that, you know what, I, I think you're going to have to double that budget if you're going to get the results you want. They mm -hmm. don't think I'm just being self-interested, Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because you're now a trusted advisor um, who is simply there to help them solve problems. Um, and whatever comes up, we'll figure it out together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And again, there's a pretty strong theme there about building that human relationship is sort of core to all of this, isn't it? I think it is. Hmm. All right. Thanks, Sheila. This has been really fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you and find out how to get a hold of your books and perhaps even reach out and say thank you for what you've shared today? Uh, well, so one of the things that has turned into a big asset is having a very unique name these days, which I used to hate as a kid. <laughs> now, these days I appreciate uh, so if you just Google Sheila Heen, S-H-E-I-L-A-H-E-E-N, um, you will very quickly come up with um, a link to Triad Consulting Group. And we have a page called Help Yourself where you can download um, preparation worksheets, additional resources, et cetera. And then, of course, difficult conversations and thanks for the feedback are, are sold anywhere 
good books are sold. How's mm. that? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Well, we'll um, we'll post some links in the show notes to the episode as well to make it even easier for people to find you and and click through to those links. Thank so you. So what? What number one piece of advice would you like to leave our listener with today, um, particularly if they're sort of aspiring to be leaders in innovation and in their field? Yeah. Maybe it's always be asking, what are we not doing because we don't know how to do it and it feels uncomfortable? So just lean into that confusion and discomfort because that's where that's what's going to lead you to your next innovation. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. Great advice. So finally then, Sheila, who would you like me to chat with on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why? Ah, great question. Um, I'm going to recommend Kathy Salit, uh, S-A-L-I-T, um, because I think she is going to be right up your alley in an interesting way. So Kathy wrote a book called Performance Breakthrough. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, her work really centers around how, what they call the becoming principle. How do you learn to do what you don't know how to do? Hmm. Sounds fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy to introduce you. Okay. I'd love that. So we'll reach out to Kathy and see if we can have a conversation with her as well. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Sheila. I've really appreciated you taking time and chatting with us about all things negotiation, having difficult conversations and feedback in particular. I've, I've learned quite a bit. I've got a question to ask you about feedback at the end after we finish the recording and I'm going to change the question based on what you've told us. So yeah. thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thank you for sure. It's been delighted to be on. <laughs> Well, wasn't that an engaging and informative conversation with Sheila? I hope you really enjoyed it as much as I did and took something away from her episode. Sheila shared so many valuable bits of insight and advice. My big takeaway from this episode was her way of asking for specific feedback. And I actually applied her suggestion immediately after the episode when I normally ask my guests for some feedback on how I've done as a conversation host. I'd love to know what you took away from Sheila's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Sheila Heen. That is S-H-E-I-L-A-H-E-E-N. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Sheila Heen. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Sheila there, as well as links to the Triad Consulting website and the free resources Sheila mentioned, as well as links to Sheila's books. Sheila suggested we have a conversation with Kathy Saylet, author of Performance Breakthrough, A Radical Approach to Success at Work, on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So, Kathy, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Sheila Heen. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free for you, my podcast listener, and accessible without even giving me your email. But most importantly, in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity about your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery, or our help with putting together your very own podcast and producing that for you, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we'll set up a quick call to have a conversation and find out if we're indeed a good fit for one another. Tune in again next week to the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Sarah Anderson of Visibility Co. and Joey Coleman, the author of Never Lose a Customer Again. 
Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have. So go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.